Uh, okay, so we're back. <laughs> I'm sorry for the delay. I see we have some people here who are here live. My internet is acting up a little bit today. Fingers crossed that'll be the last time it does it. So before we dive in, I first want to say thank you to our sponsor, Offering Tree, who is a company who is doing amazing things for our yoga teachers who need a website, need to schedule people, have payments, and also build a library of online videos and and. Uh, set it up in a really organized way. So thank you so much, Offering Tree. Thanks, Neil, for being here today. Thanks, Shannon. It's a, it's a pleasure. Uh, tell us, what is the work that you do and who do you do it for? Um, well, I guess, you know, it sort of evolved. Uh, I guess I should mention I've been a physiotherapist since 1985. And so, um, yeah, my first sort of response to the work that I do is I help people who have complex chronic pain problems. So I, I had a you know very varied uh, experiences early on in my career in physiotherapy, working in different hospitals, working in neonatal intensive care, working in you know adult trauma intensive care, and then really moved into um, as I moved more into um, uh, private practice, I got really interested in chronic pain really sort of early on and helping people who had complex chronic pain. And so now it, uh, my work has sort of evolved more into educating others and sharing all the stuff that I've learned from people in chronic pain with other healthcare professionals. And so the work that I do is sort of uh, spans um, teaching people in pain about pain, teaching yoga therapists and yoga teachers about, about pain and how do, we, how do we integrate what we understand about pain into what we do as a yoga teacher or yoga therapist. And then also um, even teaching uh, doctors. I'm a professor at uh, University of British Columbia, and I teach in the physiotherapy program, and I also teach in the um, the, the medical specialty program around pain management. So it's sort of a more of a teaching role these days than, than anything else. So where did everything come into play? I know that you're a physiotherapist, yoga therapist, yoga teacher. What came first? Was it yoga or physiotherapy? Oh, it was physiotherapy for sure. Um, uh, well, actually, I trained, interestingly, I trained to be a phys ed teacher, and then once I was in university, I I learned about physical therapy actually for the first time. Actually, I learned about occupational therapy first and thought, hey, I really like that idea. And um, then was sort of convinced by the faculty to uh, not go occupational therapy, go to physical therapy. Although um, a lot of my occupational therapy friends think I'm an occupational therapist wannabe. Um, because it's interesting, a lot of the uh, a lot of the perspectives of yoga really align well uh, with occupational therapy. Occupational therapy is much more of a biopsychosocial kind of approach. Um, and yoga is even more expansive than that. So I had dabbled in meditation over the years and been really, you know, sort of interested in different things. And, and, um, but then when I actually, when I moved from Ontario to, to, uh, Vancouver in 1997, you know, the, the, the yoga Mecca, I just kept on finding people to keep telling me, you know, you really got to do yoga, you know, with what you think. And so um, I went and what was great was I realized that I could actually meditate and move at the same time. And, and really, um, I fell in love with it. I, I, I uh, started to do Hatha yoga, just sort of at the local community center. And then um, we had the real grace to find this, this couple who taught, who really, really were teaching traditional yoga and uh, in the midst of vinyasa classes. And so like, you know, the, the, the stuff that they shared in the midst of these classes was incredible. And so I just, I fell in love with, with uh, the philosophy. And then, um, then from there, it's when I went on and, and trained to be a yoga teacher and trained to be a yoga therapist. Um, the first yoga therapy training that I did was with Phoenix Rising Yoga Therapy, which is way over there from being a physical therapist, right? So it's it, uh, Phoenix Rising, attracts a lot of the people who are counselors and psychologists, psychologists, social workers, uh, or at least it did at that time. And so um, I guess I would say since uh, I've been teaching yoga since around 2000 or so, and um, uh, did yoga therapy, I think uh, it was 2005, I can't remember, somewhere around then, 2005, when I, I started teaching as a yoga therapist. And so now within yoga therapy, I, um, I teach in um, uh, Yoga Therapy International, the School of Embodied Yoga Therapy. 
um, Inner Peace Yoga Therapy, which is based in the United States. Um, there's a program in Calgary called the Gold Program. Uh, Trish Robinson and, um, uh, well, that's so horrible, Val, and I can't remember Val's last name, but anyway. So um, teaching a number of different yoga therapy training programs now. I'm not sure if we've lost you again, Shannon. I'll just pause and wait. Okay, I can hear you. So I'm okay. I'm guessing, I'd love it for those who are here live. Can you still hear, hear Neil even when my internet drops out? And that's what we're really here for anyway. Um, let me know in the comments if that's okay. the case. And also post some questions in there as well in the comments. Uh, Neil, I wanna know where did the pain science start to come in what was the mm. what was the catalyst for that i have to say the catalyst actually was that patients were telling me about pain they're telling me you know they're about their pain and what they're telling me about pain did not match with what i learned in school and this happened really really early on in in my work and uh apparently i did a, an unusual thing is that um i decided that maybe what i learned in school wasn't right um, which apparently, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've all had that experience of, of um, you've got this view about things and someone comes along and uh, what happened to them is different from what you believe. And so what we tend to do, I've learned, is that we decide that person is just out an outlier. They're different in some way and don't worry about it. But I'm not going to change my worldview based on one person. But I kept on hearing these stories, and also all of a sudden it's like, here's my real view about pain, like really that pain is directly related to tissue damage, and that if there's tissue damage, there will be pain, and you can't get better if tissue damage didn't get better, all that stuff. And then, but I kept on seeing people who didn't fit into that that uh, view, and so um, that's really for me that was the start. And uh, in the 1980s, there were really no courses on pain. There was the textbook of pain by Melzack and Wall, um, and there really wasn't a whole lot. And so I just kept on being interested and being curious and you know trying to learn. And then uh, it would have been about 1995 or so that that um, there's a physiotherapist, a physiotherapist from uh, New Zealand, and uh, he taught this course that had a little bit about pain in it, and and he was giving a little bit more of the science, and I would. I was really excited. It's like, wow, there are actually people actually paying attention to this. Um, and very shortly after that, I, um, you know, as I started to reach out to people, I learned about David Butler and his his book, The Sensitized Nervous System, um, which led me into um, Lewis Gifford and and a whole bunch of other people. That there were other people starting to write about this uh, in the '90s. And uh, so, really, from there, it just sort of kept on growing, and I kept on reaching out and and trying to find as much as I could from different people. And really, you know, David Butler and Laura Mosley have been the seemingly the biggest catalyst in in our world around bringing the idea of educating people in pain about pain, um, which is really interesting because um, you know in in yoga we we talked with the kleshas and you know one of the kleshas is ignorance, a uh, lack of knowledge, and so um, we you know the idea here would be is that we suffer because we don't understand what's really going on. And I think that's part of what happens around uh, when we have ongoing pain is that we have we have these beliefs about pain, and those beliefs lead us to do certain behaviors. Um, and I should point out it's not just us who have pain; it's also our our society and our healthcare system has beliefs about pain, and that means that we give certain things to people who have pain, um, you know, or or the. Society sort of says, well, the first thing you should do is go to a doctor and see if the doctor can fix it, which is really fascinating because um, science is saying, well, yeah, you want to make sure you don't have something that needs medical attention. Uh, but the first thing that we should really do is actually is education and self-care, um, which actually, if I can frame it this way. So if you get injured and you have pain, you will do self-care. You will do things. You will change your behavior. You'll do things to try to make it feel better. Um, and then typically what happens is most of us just get better doing self-care, right? We take care of ourselves. We really don't need anything. But then we go into um, to see uh, healthcare people. And, and it's almost like things shift from, 
it's not about what I need to do before. It was all about what I was going to do to help myself get better. But now it's, here's this expert who's going to either fix me or give me something to cover it up or something. But it's almost like my self-efficacy part has been shifted. And so, and that's okay because the majority of us actually get better when we get, when we see a physiotherapist, massage therapist, chiropractor, whoever it is, we typically get better. Most of us do. But then there's the, the, the thing that happens is some of us don't get better with that standard care. And unfortunately, what the system sort of believes is, oh, well, if you're not getting better, you must have a, like a worse problem or we need to diagnose you better. The system doesn't say, hey, what if we added back in self-care again? What if we actually got you to understand pain better and actually showed you the things that you could do to get better? And now we've got what I'm doing to help you, right? And the things that you're doing to help you. And maybe together, those things will actually make it so now you'll get better again. And go ahead. I was just going to say this is fascinating. Also, thank you for dealing with whatever the internet is throwing out here. You just <laughs> seem to be going with it. And I can tell you've got a good, solid yoga practice going on. <laughs> um, <laughs> What I'm fascinated to know here now is if we have a student or we are in pain, mm -hmm. like what would be amazing is if everyone had the pain science knowledge on the planet, you know, if that's like right. taught in school or something, but we right. don't, we often, like you said, we, we think, oh gosh, I'm in pain. It's not going away. Right. And now I need to find someone who can fix this. Right. Where do you think, because okay, so I'm not a physiotherapist, I'm a yoga teacher. Right. I make sure that I tell, I refer people to their medical team, you know, have you seen a physiotherapist or, right. or your doctor, because I want to make sure there's not something yes. happening. So I kind of want to know, what do you wish yoga teachers would do in that moment, or people who are mm. feeling pain? I think what I wish that we would do is actually um, pause and be curious and consider that, uh, I mean, I don't know how to stimulate this, but you know, the idea would be to consider that maybe pain is not what we think it is. I mean, in the moment, that's pretty hard to sort of get someone to get there. Um, but uh, really, the if we were to add something to everyone, it would actually get, ask people to think about what they think about pain. I mean, that would be the course that would be solve so much of this is just because we have thoughts about pain, we have beliefs about pain, but we never question them. We never get curious about them. We never actually sit back and think, oh, you know, that thing I think about pain, what's happening right now does not match with that thing that I think about pain, right? You know, th this idea that um, if I'm injured, the pain, the, the pain can't go away until the injury is better. But I mean, all of us have had injuries and you can see the injury is still there. Obviously the tissue hasn't fully healed, but a lot of times, mostly it doesn't hurt. But we we never we never uh, have that opportunity to really to think about what we think about pain, and that's really you know if you if you looked at um, explain pain and we look at what we bring into um, education, yoga teachers and yoga therapists, it's to in part that's what we're asking uh, or what we're trying to do is give people experiences so they can do it. So in if we go back to the person, so you have a say you're a yoga teacher and uh, the person comes up to you and says. Um, uh, every time I've done downward dog for the last couple of weeks, I get this pain in the front of my shoulder. What should I do? Right. So I think what, what we want to do is recognize is that we have options. I mean, the first thing is that, and, and I, I know Shelly would have talked about this a little bit on your podcast, and Carolyn would have said something about it, um, is this, this, this idea is that um, pain is a complex, multifaceted thing. It's not just about tissue damage. There's other things involved in it. And within yoga, we've got this idea that there's, we have many aspects to us, and and we have practices within yoga that allow us to be uh, to contemplate, to be curious, right? And so it's you know um, what we tend to do, unfortunately, when that person says I've got the pain in my shoulder, is we tend to say, well, if it hurts, don't do it, or if it hurts, take child's pose. And I guess what I want to say at the beginning is that's absolutely valid stuff to do, perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with doing this, but then to come back to the idea of that yoga is about helping people be more flexible, as in be more adaptable, to have more options. So these are perfectly fine options, but what else does yoga say that we actually might use as an option, right? And so the option might be to, you know, while you're doing the practice today, um, maybe what you want to do is so we can pay attention to alignment, 
right? But we can also say what's going on with your breath. And we could also look at what's happening in your lower mind and those more automatic aspects of you. And what's happening in your 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 higher mind? Like, what are you actually thinking like, thinking about in that moment when you have the pain? Or what's the emotion that's coming up in that moment? Um, and like, how are you responding to that? Like, are you just trying to push it down? You're trying to suppress it? Um, are you finding that you're like totally sucked into it? And you can't think of anything but the pain, and that's freaky. You know, to to, to you know become curious about um, every aspect of our existence in that moment, even to look at. You know, can I find a sense of peace? You know, so, you know, one of the things you might say to the person is, well, um, you know, we've done the practice where you're really touching, you know, getting in touch with your heart and feeling connected to the world. Can you, while you do your downward facing dog today, could you try to recreate that sensation or that, that experience and just see, see, does that change this at all? Right. Um, and I guess I, the other point I should make here is that um, the little scenario I just gave you is really it's contrived, right? Um, that uh, there are other things that we'd want to know. If a person says that it hurts every time they do it, but it's no worse, I think we can all feel pretty comfortable that this is not something that you need to worry about. If a person's saying, I've had pain in my shoulder for the last two weeks and this is getting worse and worse and worse, the options that would make the most sense here are we need this assessed, right? We should get this assessed and, and for today, probably best to, you know, to, um, take child's pose and imagine it or do something like that. Very different from a person who's saying, it hurts when I do it and when I finish, it's not provoked. Um, you know, in one case that we would we would want to definitely uh, get some assessment either we would assess that, that person or get them to see someone who might assess them. Okay, this is so great. And I feel like I'm about to have one of those moments where I think it was because Shelly said something like, you need to talk to Neil about, <laughs> about saying, like, we don't just say in a yoga class, or, or to rethink saying in a yoga class, if it hurts, don't do it. Mm. And I was like, oh, but because I know I many times in yoga classes, mm. if there's pain, back away from that. So mm. what are your thoughts around this in a yoga class and that cue? Mm. So I would come back to the idea is that the cue is perfectly fine when it's intentional. So we want to not just say it, just that's what we say when a person has pain. We want to be intentional about it. So there would be times when you say, yeah, that's, that's, but we're not sure what's going on. Let's pause with that. Um, yet at the same time to recognize, or the, sorry, the other piece is to recognize that every single time we say that, what we're actually doing is we're reinforcing an embedded belief about pain. So the, one of the really powerful embedded beliefs about pain is that pain and tissue damage go together. If it hurts, there's damage, right? And so if someone says it hurts and you say don't do it, what you're actually doing is reinforcing that pain always means tissue damage. And unfortunately, at the same time as you're doing that, you're likely uh, creating a sense of uh, inadvertently creating a sense of fragility and a sense of fear in that person, right? You're actually building up some more of the clashes and, and that's not your intention right your intention is to keep the person safe and so it's that there's this balancing act that we need to sort of figure out is how do we how do we keep people safe so that they're not just suppressing the pain and gritting their teeth and carrying on and actually causing harm um, at the same time as how do we how do we get people to challenge their limitations right because um, i mean it's one of the interesting things is there will be pain in asana I mean, there will be pain in sitting. If you meditate, it hurts. And and so can you see how how the if our only response is if it hurts, don't do it, you're sort of stuck? Because then we often get what um, the very first person I saw who had a sort of yoga kind of injury was actually from a meditation retreat. Um, at, at the end of the first day, he went to the, the, the teacher and said that, you know, he's got this pain in his hip and his legs getting all uh, numb and tingly. And uh, what he was uh, suggested he should do is to watch it, to just be with it, watch it, you know, just watch how it fluctuates. Um, and at the end of the second day, he went back and he, he said, you know, it, it's worse, right? And and his the, he got the very same response again. Um, and apparently this happened the third day um, as well. And what actually was happening is for whatever reason, well, the way he was sitting, he was actually putting enough force on his sciatic nerve itself, like the big sciatic nerve, they actually cause some damage to the sciatic nerve. 
it was actually somehow limited the blood flow enough to the nerve that there was some damage to the nerve. They ended up with neuropathic pain and such afterwards. But anyway, the point is that there's this other part of yoga that says that, um, you know, watch things and see what happens. But watch things and see what happens. We also want to be discerning about it, right? So if it, this, this part of the thing is that sometimes when we watch things, we start to realize, wow, that's so cool. When I watch it, I can see it changing. I can see it fluctuating over time. And sometimes even people have that experience of just taking your attention to the pain makes it change in a positive way, which is a pretty good sign, right? Of course, I guess we need to recognize this. If you have pain in your shoulder and you go and you pay attention to it and the pain gets less, that does not mean that it's not related to what's happening in the shoulder. It just means that the act of taking your attention to it is associated with a change in the pain. And it tells you something else important about pain is that pain is changeable, that we have some influence over it. But what it doesn't tell you is that that's what the cause of the pain was. Maybe I'll say it in a bit of a different way. If you're doing downward facing dog, and you've got that pain in the front of the shoulder and I came up to you and I say, you know, you know how you can like draw your shoulder blades down your back just a little bit and lengthen, really lengthen through your, your thoracic and, and neck areas and how you can sort of pull the ball of your humerus into the socket. You can do all that stuff, sort of draw yourself in, make yourself long while you're doing this and you do it and you say, hey, the pain's gone. What we're likely to do and unfortunately flawed logic, is we're likely to decide that the pain was because of the alignment. But all we know is that you change the alignment and the pain changed. We don't know the cause of the pain yet, right? Because pain is always multifaceted. So um, uh, when you change the alignment, you felt might have felt more confident. Right. By drawing in, maybe it made you feel more safe or maybe more at ease or more at peace. I'm an expert. I gave you this information and you took on that. Right? I gave you that information with this idea that this would help. And that changes your expectation. Right. So, I mean, it's interesting is, yes, we changed the alignment, but we also changed what you're thinking and what you're emoting. And we changed all these other aspects of you. And so all we can say is that it changed because of this. But that's part of the trouble that we have, right? Is that, that um, if we come back to the beginning, if we sit and think about what we think about pain, we start to realize that it's changeable by many, many things, right? And if we sit and we think about what we think about pain and, and also about yoga, we realize that from yoga, we believe that there are many aspects of us and that each of those aspects of us can change every other aspect of us. Right, and so I mean, well, that's one of the beauties of of this stuff around um, about pain science and yoga therapy is that you can use any aspects of your existence to change any aspect of your existence. I mean, that's fantastic. You've got this thing happening. You know, you've got a pain that that you feel in your shoulder. Well, that doesn't mean you need to change your shoulder. Yes, change your shoulder, but you've got all these other aspects of you that you could change to see what that would do. Right change the automatic stuff, change the way you breathe, reconnect to peace, reconnect to the world, you know, do bhakti, do yana, you know, all these different things can, can change it as well. Oh, I think, I think Shannon, you're a little stuck, so I'll sort of keep on going a little bit. So um, we, we talked about options a little bit. And so we have the options of you know, if it hurts, maybe we modify what we do with the body, or maybe we try a bit of different breath practice. Uh, I think one of the other valid options that we'd want to do is to consider uh, imagery. Because we know that sometimes if something hurts, um, if, we, um, if we can imagine doing the movement before we actually do it, then sometimes that even works even better. <laughs> hey, you're back. I feel, like, I feel like I'm over here doing like a small meditation in patience with technology today. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know. I, a, I feel like I've cut you off on Lisa's statement, but go ahead and finish whatever. No, but this is this is actually a great place to sort of go to this, is that it's one of the other things we say is that, um, you know, there's a difference between discomfort and pain. And I think what, what my suggestion is this, is it to consider that that's something that we learn over time and through the practices of um, having permission to explore and being able to be curious and finding that place of safety to explore. Um, and that for most of us, as Lisa's pointing out here, is that most of us, when we start, uh, most of us do not have a good 
understanding of which is which. And of course, we also need to recognize is that pain is not an accurate indication of tissue damage. So we can't just say, if you call it pain, then that's tissue damage, because that's not true. I mean, if I just grab my earlobe, anybody listening, if you want to try this, you know, as long as you're fine, otherwise, you grab your earlobe and just squeeze it for a while, it will start to hurt, right? And just, and then you let it go, the pain's going to go away. But that pain was really intense. That was pain, right? But you weren't damaged. And we need to be careful that we don't have this idea that, well, if we call it discomfort, then we know we're okay. And if we call it pain, uh, then that is damage. We don't know that. It's not that simple. Um, I'll just give you one other example of this is that in school, we learned to, to get people to uh, do the zero to 10 scale. You know, how would you rate your pain? Zero is no pain, 10 is the worst. And so um, what's really fascinating, years ago, this guy, uh, I asked him and he says, well, it's zero. I'm like, well, that's a little surprising, you know, because the pain's really bad. So really there's no pain, it feels perfectly fine. And he says, well, no, it doesn't feel perfectly fine, but I just wouldn't call it a pain. I said, well, what would you call it? And he said, well, I'd call it a discomfort. And I said, okay, so on a zero to 10 scale, zero is no discomfort, 10 is the worst you can get. What are you? And he, and he tells me the number. And then I'm like, I'm saying this to him and I've never thought of it before. And I said, so hang on a sec. Are you telling me you've got a zero to 10 scale for discomfort? And then when you get to, once you get from to 10 of discomfort, then it's pain. And this fellow's answer was just so informative. He looks at me and says, well, doesn't everybody? Oh my gosh, I love this so much <laughs> that he's, he. it makes total sense, really. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it was really fascinating is recently someone else has said to me, well, I actually have three scales. Right? There was something below discomfort. But I think that this, you know, this is the, the unique individuality of it. And we've been taught in trying to keep people safe, we've been taught things like if it's discomfort, it's okay. Or we've been taught that um, pain's okay, but if it's a sharp pain, that's not okay. And that's not necessarily true, right? So um, pain is a protective mechanism, or we could say it's part of the protective mechanisms of us. And so when the pain feels more dangerous to us, that means that the systems are determining that this is more dangerous. It's not that it is uh, that the problem in the body is particularly more dangerous. It's just the systems have come up with the, the, the determination that it is. And they can come up with that determination based on absolutely everything, including your genetics, right? Including your ancestors and gen genetics. And we're just trying to learn that we can you know, pass on uh, how the the, the nociceptive apparatus or the, the apparatus of the body that tells us about danger stuff is impacted by genetics. It's impacted by everything that's happened in your life. It's impacted by all the predictions of the future, right? It just absolutely everything changes it. How much you slept in the last while, the chemistry of your body right now, your, your endorphins, everything is changing this thing, right? But we really have this idea that it's all to do with with just the damage of the body. And so if it, we have this sense without thinking about it is that if it feels sharp, that must mean that there's a worse problem in our body. And it might be, but the thing is that it might not be. And we need to be careful about that is, as yoga teachers and yoga therapists, when a person says they have sharp pain, if you follow that, oh, well, if it's sharp, you shouldn't do it. Once again, you're, you're not providing any room to explore. All right. And so maybe if you want to sort of morph what you're doing and say is if a person says it's more intense, if it feels more scary to them, then this is something where you'd want to, when you're getting the person to move, be more gentle. But give the person still an opportunity to find that place of comfort and safety from which they can explore this. Right. That's um, amazing. I think, yeah. you know, you get really excited about this, I can tell. <laughs> and you're like, isn't it fabulous? Isn't it fantastic? You're using like, we're so complex, like it must be very frustrating for scientists who are trying to like come up with clear <laughs> answers. When it's like, it could be your genetics or how much sleep you had. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, well, yes, because we are, I mean, as as healthcare people, we are taught, um, I think I can still clearly say this. We are taught to be right or wrong. We we're taught to be definitive. And what, we, what we're what we taught is to look for algorithms. So you come in with this and I'm gonna do this. And, you know, or if you, you came in with this, I'd do something different. And so we'd have this this algorithm that you go through. So to, to work with people who have 
uh, persisting pain is to work in an area of uncertainty. And of course, this is where our personal practice of yoga becomes so important is for us to find a way to be okay with that. Um, because it, it's, um, uh, I mean, I, it's sort of funny. I've, I've had patients stand up and put their hands on their hips and look at me and go, this is just trial and error, isn't it? Right? Because what we need to do because of the uncertainty is we need to try things out and then reassess how things are, are going. Um, and not just decide, well, you've got this, so I'm going to give you this and it will make you better. So this is what you've told me is going on and we're going to try these things, but we're going to reassess what's happening and we're going to morph what we're doing based on what happened with you. Um, can, can, can I give you a specific example of that? That's yeah, really I would love an example. Yes. So a couple of weeks ago, I was talking with a number of colleagues, uh, rehab professional colleagues across Canada, and we were talking about people who have long COVID, who, who have COVID symptoms that are sticking around. Um, and um, there, this conversation came up about how there's so many people with long COVID. Um, it's like, no matter how small you do exercise or activity increase, it actually makes them worse, right? And so the conversation was all about how do we actually, you know, what should we do? What, what, what term or what kind of exercise, what kind of activity should we get that person to do? Because of course, exercise is medicine, right? Exercise helps you get better. So, but what we sh what should we do? And what was really amazing is I'm sitting back thinking, this is fascinating. Here's an assumption. The assumption is that exercise is always medicine. And of course, in um, Ayurveda, there's you know uh, everything is medicine and everything is poison. It depends on when and when, how much and all those things. So, but here's this group of healthcare professionals that had this idea of how do we find the right amount of exercise? And they're thinking about grading it down, grading it down. But even in that, they're saying, even when we do really small things, people get worse for days afterwards. And so they were, what they were, the whole conversation was about what do we do to help that person get better? Right? Or how, how do we help them be able to move more? And so you can see that the embedded belief was sort of problematic here. And you know, so my comment to him was, so you're telling me that you're reassessing these individuals and that they have remained worse for days. You've actually provoked them and they have not been able to recover really well. And they're all like, well, yeah, that's exactly it. And I said, well, maybe it's the wrong time to do this. You know, you, your, your reassessment is telling you that it didn't work, that actually made the person better, but you wanna keep on going with it because you have a belief that says that it should help people get better. And, and I think this becomes, there's so many pieces of this, right? It says that, anything that we give people within yoga or yoga therapy, we need to give it to them with an idea of how would I know if this helped? How would I know if it's the wrong thing, right? And so, but then assess that. If, if it's not serving the person we're with, right? And then maybe there's something you want to do to change it around, but maybe it's the wrong thing to do right now. Maybe it's just not the right approach at this time. You need to come at it a bit of a different way. And so if you had that person with the shoulder pain and you asked them to try um, uh, breathing in a certain way and it just agitated them more, well, obviously that's not the right approach, but we've got lots of approaches we can take. This is so powerful. I feel like I experienced this on both things that you're saying. So I had a herniated disc this past summer. And many told me like walking is good for you. But when I would try and increase my walking, I would be on bed rest longer. And it was just mm -hmm. like, that's not what was needed. And it finally took Sean, who's my partner uh, and a yoga teacher and also a health and science writer was like, if you broke your foot, nobody would be telling you like, it's best to hop around or walk around <laughs> on this thing that needs healing. Why, why are you pushing it? He asked. Mm -hmm. And then... On the flip side of this, you were talking about the sharp shooting pain, which I have said many times as a yoga teacher, if the pain is sharper shooting, don't do it. Well, I was walking around. So I'm, it was August when I had the herniated disc, I could walk now. And things are, I'm, I'm looking at my pain many times, like, I, I feel like I'm healing, and my brain and my body is learning how to deal with this. And I had this sharp shooting pain when I would walk and my family, I, it would like, buckle me almost to falling wow. down and i said they were like like in a panic like you need to go and do something and i said i actually don't think so i have this feeling that it's just like 
Mm. Something settling out because I've listened to Carolyn Van Dyke and Shelley Prosco, your work, and I just thought, I'm going to see in the next few days. Like, sure, I'll try and rest more or I'll see what irritates mm -hmm. it. But you know what? Like, I could walk outside and it was fine. So I was really having this conversation, even though it was a sharp shooting pain and now it's gone. And I think it was related to my nervous system much more than my tissues. That's my guess. It, it, I mean, it certainly could be. There's so it's so hard to know, but I think there's a couple of things that you said that I think are important. One is that um, you had this sense that it wasn't something that you needed to really freak out about or really move away from. That that um, and I think what we we when we are working with other people who have pain is that we often forget that that person is an expert in their pain. Now. I know pain's not accurate, uh, yet we still can say to the person, does it feel like this is serving you? Does it feel like this is actually uh, being detrimental to you? And there's a lot of times when people say, yeah, you know, this feels like the kind of thing that I should work on, but maybe I need to change it. And other times people are saying, yeah, this, no, this does not feel like it's serving me right now. And I would say, for well, for right now, move over here. It'd be like for you with the, um, at some point you need to forward bend again, right? Because not only because we forward bend in life, but if you want to make the tissue around your lower back healthy again, you need to actually reintroduce all the movements that are part of the normal movement of the body. Um, but we need to do that at the right time, right? So if you start early, it probably would continue to provoke you. And the more you did it, it would probably be harder to move around. And we'd say, well, that's not the right thing to do. So one of the other ways that we can know, is it the right amount of activity? When, we, when we're convinced that the person in front of us can actually be curious and uh, isn't just going to grit their teeth and push like crazy through this thing is to say, so, you know, one of the things you could do is work on provoke it and recover. And if you, if you went out walking and you said, yeah, it hurts while I walk, but when I sit down, the pain goes away pretty darn fast, right? Then that, that recovery part would tell you, this is probably an okay amount of activity. And then you need to grade it for your decision. Um, if you did it and you said, hey, the uh, the pain was worse for hours after I did that walk, then that sort of sounds like that's not the right thing to do. And so one of the ways that we can think about this and sort of explore and try to come up with the language around is the idea that um, it's okay to provoke the sy symptoms if you feel at the end that the benefits of what you did outweigh the consequences. And this is so... Maybe I'll say it another different way. So uh, years ago, I see this woman, she's got back pain. She's been getting better and better and better. She comes in on a Monday morning and she's not really able to stand up straight. She's, you know, sort of holding her back. The pain's worse again. And she's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, you know, and she's like setting herself up. She's like, she knows what I'm going to say. She says, you know, my friends are going out dancing on Saturday night and I know I shouldn't have done it. I know you're going to give me grief about it, but I did. And, you know, that's why I'm so sore. And it was one of those other times that I'd never actually asked this question before, but I said to her something like, do you believe that the benefits of what you did outweighed the consequences? And she's like, absolutely, yes. And I'm like, well, then it's okay, right? Because there are benefits of doing this, of social connection and benefits of movement and all that stuff. Now, this doesn't mean that we want you to go out and annoy it every single night, but it's a very different thing than if you said, that um, I just paid for it. It was just all regret and all I paid for it afterwards. And, and this is another way that we can sort of grade this with an understanding of the complexity of this. But the only way that this makes sense is if we can get past the idea that pain equals tissue damage. And that's so hard because people hearing me are gonna be saying, but how do I know if they're safe? That's a great question, yeah. Right? Uh, yeah. yeah, how do we know as yoga teachers if, if it is tissue damage that they're <clears throat> right. They're experiencing. So uh, it could be that there's actually issues going on in the tissues that we need to address. Um, but I think the thing that there's two bits to that are important is there's when the, the danger detection systems of our body work properly, which is most of the time, um, there is a buffer between when the pain will start and when damage would happen. So if I pull my finger back, the pain starts before damage would happen. There's always a buffer in there. But 
this is a really important part is if the person in front of you has persisting pain, the buffer is bigger, not smaller, right? Because what's happened if you've had pain that's persisted is neuroplasticity, right? What's happened is the, 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 the apparatus of your body, the nervous system apparatus of your body that tells you about dangerous stuff, it's been practicing. And because it's been practicing, it now is going to respond in a bigger way sooner than before. Whereas the alarm, were to, you had to move this far to get the alarm before. Now you only have to move this far to get the alarm and damage is still up there. And so if a person has persistent pain, and, and this is another reason why understanding some stuff about pain science is so important, is that it does it makes no sense if your if your view is pain and damage always go together. This stuff makes no sense at all. This sounds like crazy talk, right? Because we're just going to injure people. Uh, if we can get people to understand that um, pain is not an accurate indication of what's happening in the body, then and also this idea that when pain persists, the the apparatus, the protections, the protective mechanisms get better at protecting us because they've been practicing. And so there will be actually a bigger buffer. So we can we can we can feel we can feel safer when we ask that person, you know, while you're moving, if you make the pain a little bit worse, it's okay. And then you know, back off, sort of go there, back off, go there, back off, because there's a buffer between that spot where the pain gets worse and where damage will happen. And what if you keep on doing that over time, what actually happens if you keep on going up and you're nudging it, uh, if you do it the right way, if you keep nudging it, you can actually move the alarm back up. And so you can actually learn how to move with more ease, um, which is the genesis of, of putting together um, these movement guidelines that we created that, I know Matthew Remsky said, oh, they're like interoceptive movement guidelines you've set up, Neil. And I sort of like that idea, interoceptive. Uh, so that if pain is not an accurate indication of how much to move, um, well, what is? And the answer would be no one thing is, as far as we know that your ability to breathe calmly is not an accurate indication that you're safe to move. Your ability to calm your body tension is not an accurate indication. Your ability to calm your mind is not an accurate indication, but you can use them all. If we got you to be more discerning, right, to be curious. So as you move, if we can get you to pay attention to your breath, your body tension, and your mind, and the pain, you're now listening to four alarm systems. Because if you start to push the edge, right? If you start to push in a place where your systems are saying, hey, this might be dangerous, what it, the systems of your body tend to do is make you hold your breath or your breath gets short and shallow. So that's like a protective system alarm going off, right? If you're, if you're doing that, your body will start to grip, right? The grippers of your body will start to grip. And so if you're feeling that, that's another alarm. If your mind is starting to grip or getting anxious or getting fearful, again, that's another alarm. And the pain is another alarm. So one of the things we can do is learn to, as we're, if we have pain when we move, is to say, well, uh, none of these things by themselves is good enough. How about I'll pay attention to each and become more discerning over the time of how hard I can sort of push this edge. Um, and so what we ask people to do is to consider uh, around the mind piece, we ask people to consider, is this safe? Does this feel safe for my body to do this? And if the person says yes, then to ask the second question of, uh, will I be okay later? Like that recovery piece. And if the person says, yeah, I think it's safe for my body to do this and I think I'll be okay later, then while you do it, go to the edge and do your best to keep your breath calm and your body calm and don't ignore the pain and don't pay this much attention to the pain, right? You need to sort of, if, if, that's, if your normal strategy is to ignore the pain, you need to pay more attention to the pain. And if the normal thing that happens to you is, is you become hypervigilant and the only thing you can pay attention to the pain is what we need to teach you to do. You'd learn in other techniques is how to pay more attention to what you want to pay attention to or less attention to the pain, right, to do that. So it's, um, am I safe? Will I be okay later? Keep my breath calm, keep my body calm, pay some attention to the pain. And that that brings you more information, right? That's the interoceptive stuff. Pay attention to um, your mind, your breath, your body tension, and the pain. And that gives you a better understanding of how much to how hard to push and how long to go. Now, there'll be some people who say, is this foolproof? And of course we have to say, well, nothing is, right? Because the, the reality is that the, the protective mechanisms of the body are not foolproof. We all know this already. Uh, I mean, everybody's experienced um, doing a sport for a while and feeling fine during the sport, but realizing you 
later that you were injured while you're doing it or the same thing during work saying that, that sometimes the system doesn't warn you when you are doing too much but it usually does and so what we're increasing what we're doing is increasing uh the 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 chance to be able to recover function and increasing the evidence of safety around this stuff which i know a lot of people know the polyvagal theory to think about that is that what we're actually doing with this if you can keep your mind calm your breath calm and your um, body tension calm and pay some attention to the pain is that to do that you're actually increasing the evidence of safety right so when you go to the edge of course there's that some evidence of potential danger but the really important thing is that um, polyvagal theory or one of the important things that porges has shown us with the polyvagal theory is that it's about increasing evidence of safety and then challenging that edge right to, to be able to stay safe and go to where it feels a little bit dangerous that's how we change things I'm trying to figure out how to do that and that can take a lot of work right i mean you one of the things we've done with with this is we've uh we started for a long time of teaching people in pain about this stuff and then we moved into teaching yoga therapy people about this stuff working in a one-to-one -one scenario and in the last year what we've uh we put out is a thing called pain care aware which is is a two-level training program for specifically for yoga teachers because all of our training before relied on the idea that you're working with a person one-to-one -one. and what we realized is that um, there is pain in yoga and people in pain are actually coming to yoga seemingly more than before but even in yoga practice there is pain and so how do we how do we come up with a system of educating yoga teachers about about what is pain and what are the different ways that we can actually just uh, change our language and change our approach to teaching um, a yoga class that brings this information in now, how do we get away from uh, creating um, inadvertently creating a sense of fear or fragility of the body um, how do we create the sensation of or how do we get people to uh, have permission to stop when they want permission to approach the pain and give them different options to be able to do this so we created this thing called pain care aware um, the the level one part of pain care aware is a 30 hour uh 30 hours of traditional yoga and pain science put together um and put together by uh by me and shelly prosco and my wife who's a swami in uh, kriya yoga and ha has taught yoga teacher training programs for a long time at her own studio and so we sort of put all of our stuff together to create this really um, quite expansive education, um, in part because what, one of the things we realized is that people would come and, and spend a couple of days with us and they learn about pain, but then we'd talk to them later and they remember the stuff that we talked about, but they still only know it this much. And really to get this, um, we need to go that way. It's um, so true. Like you can learn a little bit and, and know it even in your own experience but then if you're working with people who are dealing with persistent pain it's a whole other thing so when you say it's 30 hours is it pre-recorded could people sign up now and, mm -hmm. and just dive right in yeah so it, it's a online self-paced program we're suggesting people take your time do it over a month or so um, you could take longer to do it once you actually sign up for it you've got it for life and so the the um, new things that we put in there um, you'll get that too um, and so we'll actually put up um, uh, yeah. a, coup a coupon code. Oh, there it is there. Um, so, so if you went to paincareaware.com and uh, you wanted to take the level one of the training, so there's the, the URL there. Um, if you put in the connected PCA 15, I'll give you a 15% um, discount um, to the program. For those of you who are listening in Canada, um, it's 395 Canadian. Um, if you're any else anywhere else in the world right now is 395 US. Um, so it's a bit of a different price depending on where your location is. Um, and so you can get 15% off of that. And if you decide that you really, really like doing this, like the information is good um, and uh, you want to do the, the level two, the level two is a practicum and sort of test out bit where you get together with other, uh, with your peers and really facilitate it over a weekend of, uh, uh, giving you a chance to use this information, teach the other people in the class and get feedback about how well you're bringing the the, the language um, of pain care wear into your work. And so just quickly, the in terms of the language parts of it, um, 
Uh, we talked about the language of curiosity and contentment and language of discernment um, and uh, the language of permission um, and a big piece about the language of self-compassion. Um, and uh, this is really, I mean, this, this program is very yoga based. Uh, it, you know, there's, there's, there's ritual and there are, you know, there's mudra and mantra and all those things are part of, of this because we think that there are so many things that we can add into what we're doing to help the people we're, we're working with. And so Shannon, near the beginning, you asked about what I would hope people would, would uh, do or know. And what we're hoping is that, uh, that this actually will be an opportunity for yoga teachers to give people the lived experience, a different lived experience around pain. And that the guidance in the class will give people that different lived experience. And, um, uh, you know, pain is a massive problem in the world. Um, it, you know, affects us individually in horrible ways. It affects society in, in big, big ways. And, and that, you know, maybe the ripple effect of this, or not maybe, the ripple effect of this could have really quite a uh, big impact on our society and, and the amount of pain. It's so true. And also the language then that we share with other people. Since my herniated disc, so many people come at me with language where I'm like, that's a lot of <laughs> fear based I my pain you know some people are very um upset that even though i'm a yoga teacher i would still get an injury and i'm like i i have a body this body's yeah um i'm going to carry on just a little bit because i think one of the things around well, what you're saying shannon is is the um oh you're back yeah sorry it keeps that's popping okay. out that's great. I mean, the the social stigma of of around this stuff is is horrible, right? Because you you got that. It's like me. I'm a physiotherapist and a yoga therapist. I've had two really really big um, disc bulges in my life. Um, the last one bulged big enough to actually uh, move my spinal cord over, and and fully pinched one of the nerves. Or I lost the. Um, for those of you who know that the, the nerves running down your legs can actually you know uh, they go to certain muscles and. And it, there was enough uh, limitation of how my signals were getting the nerve that I couldn't lift my big toe against gravity. So if I had my foot flat on the floor and I tried to lift up my big toe, I couldn't do it. But if I put my foot on the side and I did it this way, I could do it where gravity was taken away. So there was that much pressure on this this thing. Uh, but anyway, could the, but of course I had the same thing as like, you know, aren't you a physiotherapist? Aren't you a yoga therapist? Like, right? Um, and I just want to add to one other, one other really big stigma around this is that our society really has this idea that if you were just tough enough, you'd get better if you have persisting pain. And, and hopefully everyone can realize is how that drives people to grit their teeth and basically suck it up and just carry on. Um, and Shannon, what you said was so important is that there you were doing something that made sense to get better. But at the same time, it was actually leaving you provoked, right? And so what we need to recognize is that that uh, if you continued to do that, what would you do if you continue to just grit your teeth and push through it without walking? What you actually teach is your protective mechanisms is you don't listen so good, right? And, and of course, so protection mechanisms are about protection. So how might they respond to this is how might they might respond is to say, well, you're not listening. So what do I need to do? I'll get louder. Or they'll find another way to protect you, which just give you an idea of if you walk along, you smack your kneecap on something, signals fly from the kneecap up to your brain to tell you to, to give you pain. Its job is to get you to stop walking on your leg for a while, right? But you can ignore that, right? You can decide I'm going to walk on it even though, even though it hurts. And I'm sure most people have done this. And when you try to do that, usually one of two things or two things happen. One is that it might hurt more when you do it. But the other thing is you might notice that your quads got weak. So why did your quadriceps muscle get weak? Well, it's we think it's almost like the system said, well, we've detected danger. We've told you you need to change your behavior. And that didn't change your behavior. So how else could we change your behavior? How else could we get you to stop walking your leg? Ah, let's make your leg feel weak. Right? Yeah, and this, it's this, so true. It's so true yeah. that then the the message just gets louder and louder. And I'm I appreciate that you said there's a lot of stigma around this for yoga teachers, and our society asks people to push 
push harder. Mm-hmm. I would, I had yeah. this rolling in my brain and I, I definitely yeah. tried it. It didn't work. <laughs> yeah. You know, the, the other piece of it too, is that it's almost like pain has become a taboo topic and or word within yoga, which is pretty odd to me given that uh, yoga is about decreasing suffering. Um, and, and I know there's this idea that we've been taught by people is that, well, if you say the word pain, you might actually, more people might have pain. And and I would say we need to actually challenge that assumption, right? Yes, there are some people that the, using the word pain could actually make their pain experience worse. Uh, but on the other hand, to not say the word pain, because I've heard people say, I, I'd never call it pain when I'm working with people, I always call it sensation. And And I can tell you very clearly that if you did that with me, I would, I would feel absolutely invalidated. I'm telling you about my pain and you decided you're not going to call it pain. You're going to call it sensation, right? That, that's not, you know, meeting me where I'm at. And that would definitely invalidate me. So we, all this stuff that we've been taught, we've actually been taught very much like rules. Um, and we need to realize that they're guidelines, they're options, and there are more options. Um, and the only way we start to realize that they are is when we, we actually do have this opportunity to think about what we think about it and about pain and to think about what we think about pain in relationship to yoga. Um, and that really is, you know, the big, big piece of, of what we're trying to do is to, to share what we've learned from so many people with pain over the years um, and to get people to you know, share in a way that people can actually, um, yeah, think about it. This is amazing because mm-hmm. most people I talk to say, oh, I've been in pain or I'm feeling discomfort in my body or I'm not flexible enough or I can't move enough. I'm going to a yoga class. So we need our yoga teachers then to be equipped with the knowledge, the language, the tools um, to help those people who, like you said, are suffering, whatever whatever it is that they call it. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much for this work that you're doing. I do hope that our connected yoga teachers um, <laughs> head over to the site and Thank you so much for saying right before we started recording that we can have 15% off. Um, mm. That That's fantastic. Um, we're definitely going to check it out and we'll make sure to put some links as well in the show notes. Thank you, Neil, for all of the work that you do. Well, thanks, Shannon. It's been a pleasure to talk about this and I'm glad that it worked out even with uh, the internet. I know. <laughs> <laughs> the internet has been challenging us. Um, someone had said great discussion. Someone else had been talking about breath and you talked about this. I'm so glad. Um, and uh, yes, your info was amazing in Catherine Bruni Young's training. Thank you. Love your book. Tell us about the book as well, Neil, before we go. Um, well, there's two. Hang on a sec. Okay. Hold this on. is... The one that we did with Shelly Shelley Prosco and Marlisa Sullivan. So Yoga and Science and Pain Care. So this is very much a yoga therapy book. And it really dives deep into the all these different topics related to yoga and pain care. Um, so, uh, and actually, if anybody's really interested, we're on Embodia, the Embodia platform. We actually are doing a book club webinar series. So it has, um, so we're only at uh, chapter six um next week um and actually next week it's me talking about chapter six is the one that i wrote about um about yoga as about yana yoga and about using using the practices of yoga as um as educational agents so within within healthcare what we tend to do is educate people by doing what i'm doing right now um and uh but yoga is actually an opportunity to have lived experiences that change our belief system Right. So when, when I can show you how that you can move with more ease, you just learned that you have some efficacy around this and that pain is changeable. Right. And so rather than telling you that you have some efficacy and pain is changeable, I, yoga provides us an opportunity to give repeated experiences that are inconsistent with our previous determination of danger kind of thing. Um, the, other, the other book that I wrote is, is a, a basic pain education book meant more for people in pain so they can understand pain in a new way. Um, it's only like five bucks on Amazon and my website. And if you want the free narrated version, my other website is actually paincareu, like the letter U, paincareu.com. And if you went on to paincareu.com and looked at the free resources, there's a free narrated version of a book called Understand Pain, Live Well Again. Um, And we're just, um, uh, it's in English only. 
you can buy the ebook in either English or French. Um, and we're working on getting someone to do the uh, the French narration as well. Um, if for those of you who know Explain Pain that, that Lorna Mosley and David Butler wrote, um, you know, two, two men who I absolutely stand on their shoulders around this, and there's so many of us that do. Um, but anyway, they, they, when their book is really, their book Explain Pain is so expansive that, um, and I kept on running into patients who found there was too much information in it. Um, and so I went to them back in 2007 and said, hey, you know, can I write a conversational take on this? And they're like, absolutely, yeah, go ahead. So anyway, that's what this is. It's the same kind of information, but it's uh, simpler. Um, understand pain, live well again. Nice. One of our mm -hmm. uh, live listeners here says they highly recommend learning from you. And the other person said, yes, both books were great, that you make this really easy to digest. I agree. Uh, this has been fantastic. I hope that our connected yoga teachers continue to post in the comments if you have further questions for Neil. And uh, yeah, check, check all of those resources out. Thank you so much again, Neil. Oh, and thank you, Shannon. It's wonderful that... Uh... You have so many people who get to get to learn from this 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 uh, network you set up. It's fantastic. Thank you.